Well, good morning. Great to be with you again this morning. Um, so to get started this morning, I, I actually want to we get switch, switched over here. I, I, I want to start with a question that I want you to to ponder. And uh, but but let me qualify this question a little bit. The way it says it on the screen. What do you think comes to mind for most church people, not you, but for most church people when they hear the word bivocational? Okay, part-time. What else? Throw it out. Two jobs. Overloaded. Okay, that's good. Small church, okay? Again, not what you think, but what do you think most people in the church think when they hear the word bivocational? All those are great. What else? Okay, wait, there were three like mumbled together there. I couldn't get it. Go ahead, over here. What is it? Okay, <laughs> right. How do they balance all that? Right, okay, good. What else? Okay, why do you think that is? They just. Okay, all right. Okay, all right. Again, it's not what you think, okay? So don't get offended. What else? Part-time pastor. pastor. All right. What else? Okay, good. No, that's right. That's why I say church people, right? Right, but you're right. That's right. Okay, ooh. You say poor quality? Okay, again, don't get offended. It's what other people are thinking, not you. So uh, you'll notice something about all those comments. They're negative. So I even, I did this one day, <laughs> this doesn't offend anybody, but I, I threw this out one day and I thought this was like the, the, the best summary. He says it, a guy yelled out and he says, it means you suck at both work and church. <laughs> so I, and I remember I just said, we'll just stop right there. Like, like that's, well, so really you illustrated my point here really well. And that, and that's this, I think there is unfortunately a biased narrative around bivocationalism and it needs to change like it's not helpful i think it's unbiblical and um so i this morning i just want to encourage you um i'm guessing maybe 40 percent, 50 percent of the room probably is bivocational if you're not we're going to talk about some things this morning that i think will be helpful to you regardless I hope you'll be an encouragement to those that are bivocational. And then also, I would say, if someday you have to become bivocational out of necessity, you won't see it as a step down. You'll actually see it as a promotion. Because I think there are beautiful and wonderful benefits, especially in a missionary context that we all live, of being bivocational. And I'm a big both and, not an either or guy, so it's not one is better than the other. But I think as we move into an increasing missionary context, we have to like recapture uh, the the, the storyline or the narrative around bivocationalism. So how do we change the bias narrative around bivocational? There's three things I'd say we need to do. The first one is we must highlight the benefits of being bivocational. Now, we're going to go through a bunch of stuff here pretty quick. If, if, uh, if you're a note taker, take notes. But also, this is in a book. So there, is, there are printed copies of it, but this is another book that's an e-book that you can download for free. So it's called Co-Vocational Church Planting. So I wrote it a couple years ago, and I just wanted to make it accessible. So again, if you just Google Co-Vocational Church Planting, it'll take you to a landing play, page where you can download it in English or Spanish. So, But I would also say, even though what we're going to talk about here for the next few minutes is in here, I'd say really only about 10% of the book is really about church planting. The rest of it is just about living out a missionary lifestyle. So kind of in the marketplace. So just encourage you to go download that for free uh, if you don't want to be taking notes on everything. But one of the things we, I start off the book with is talking about the, the benefits of being bivocational. And I like to frame the benefits in kind of three different areas. Let me tell you what they are, and then I want us to unpack these just a little bit. What I call missional engagement benefit there's financial benefits, and then there's shared leadership benefits. So the first one is missionary engagement or missional engagement benefit. Here's the bottom line. And those of you that are bivocational, I wish we had time. I could like interview you because I'll bet if I asked you what are the top three benefits of being bivocational, I'll bet the number one you would say, you'd say it different ways, but you have access to a mission field you wouldn't have otherwise. And just the reality is full-time pastors, and I've been a full-time pastor, and uh, it's just difficult to really cultivate relationships with lost people. But if you're bivocational, you just have access to people relationally. You just wouldn't have otherwise. And people that probably 
will never or would never come to your church or a program or activity of the church. So there's this huge missionary benefit of being bivocational. But another little nuance of, of the missionary engagement benefit is I think it gives you great street cred or respectability both inside the church and outside the church. Now, again, please hear me. I'm not criticizing if you're full-time. I just think we need to highlight the benefits of being bivocational because there's some wonderful benefits. And one of them is the respectability you get both inside the church and outside the church. Here's what I mean by that. Inside the church, the reality is people appreciate if you have a part-time job in the marketplace, they appreciate that you, on some level, understand what they go through Monday through Friday. And it just gives you great respectability. But maybe even more important than that, it gives you great respectability outside the walls of the church. So most of us live and work in a place where, at best, people are skeptical of the church, and at worst, they're hostile. So if you can lead with what you do in the marketplace, I've just discovered it just opens up the opportunity for conversations and relationships that you just wouldn't have otherwise. Does that make sense? Like if you do something else in the marketplace, you don't have to start with, I'm a pastor or I'm a church planter. And I told you earlier, I've worked for the North American Mission Board for 22 years now, and I even have a different thing that I start with. I mean, when I travel, inevitably people will always say, what do you do? This might sound <laughs> silly or ridiculous, but I have a pat answer. I always say, I work for a large nonprofit that does community development. And, and I'm telling you, and, that, and I'm not deceptive. Eventually, if we talk more, I talk about I work with churches, and then it just opens up all kinds of conversations. But when I start with nonprofit that does community development, every single time there's a follow-up question. It's like, well, that's kind of cool. What do you mean by community development? Or I'll say we do neighborhood transformation things, you know, and then it gives me opportunity to talk about other, other issues. So I'm not saying <laughs> come up with your own line, but you might. I mean, you might kind of think, well, what's another way if somebody asks me that's a non-believer, and you might be in a context where maybe it's, it's a positive thing to say you're a pastor, but many people don't. So I think it just gives you great street cred if you're able to start with what you do in the marketplace, all right? So the first huge benefit, there's all kinds of benefits around this kind of missional engagement or missionary engagement benefit of being bivocational. But the second benefit is financial. So I like to frame the financial benefits in three areas. First, I think there's great financial benefit for the church planter's family. So think about it like this. If your primary support is coming from the marketplace, especially if that support includes things like insurance or vacation or some kind of retirement, it just, there's just less financial strain on the family. So there's a huge financial benefit, I think, for the church planter and the church planter's family. Secondly, I think there's a huge financial benefit for the church plant. Because think of the primary support for the church planters coming from the marketplace, there's just going to be more resources available for mission and ministry. And then third, I think there's a great benefit for the church planting entity. So in my tribe, we have local associations and state conventions, and then we have a national uh, organization. And all of them fund church planters in different ways. Well, there's not enough money out there to plant all the churches that we need to plant. So if we're going to truly see a church planting movement, we're going to have to do it with bivocational church planters. So great benefit for the church planter's family, great benefit, I think, for the church plant, and a great benefit for the church planting entity. So one of the things we have to do is highlight the benefits. There's missiological or missionary benefits, there's financial benefits, and the third one I said is shared leadership benefits. So in light of the conversation we had yesterday about APEST, I am absolutely convinced you should never plant a church without a team. And in the past, we've planted churches, and I did this once 25 years ago. We planted, or 30 years ago now, uh, we planted a church, just my wife and I, we just moved in a neighborhood, and we, and we were kind of like a parachute drop, and we just planted a church. I would never encourage anyone to do that. But to do it with a team, and especially an APES team, when you know how you're wired, make sure you have a team that, that's wired with those other different gifts. Well, if you're bivocational, there's no option to not plant with a team. Because if you're working 30 or 40 or 50 hours a week in the marketplace, everybody knows you can't do it on your own. So I'll give you a little example of this. Um, when I first moved into this new role at the North American Mission Board called Director of Bivocational Church Planning, I knew I wanted to interview as many bivocational planters as I could. And I had nine questions I would ask them. And the first question was always, what's the greatest benefit or the top three benefits? And then I'd always ask them, what's the top three greatest challenges? Well, I remember one of my favorite examples of a bivocational church planter. 
uh, he was in the D.C. area. He was actually a CIA federal agent. And this guy, w- w- he was a machine. <laughs> like, he scared me. You know? he, and he worked 50, 60. There were sometimes he worked 70 or 80 hours a week. It was ridiculous. And when I asked him about the greatest benefit, he was the only one that didn't start with access to a mission field. He started with this. He said the greatest benefit for him is he never had to ask for volunteers. Never. He said because everybody knew that James couldn't do it all. Everybody knew that James worked 50 or 60 hours a week in the marketplace. So he said he never had to ask anyone to step up. They just stepped up on their own because they knew there had to be this shared leadership. And so it actually pushes the whole uh, priesthood of all believers, which is the way we ought to operate anyway. And I just think a bivocational leader It ought to work this way. I know it doesn't always, because sometimes there's expectations from the congregation that you're the pastor, you should still do everything, which of course is very unbiblical. But I just think in a bivocational setting, it helps to kind of push that, the theme of that everybody gets to play. Not only everybody gets to play, everybody has to play, all right? So how do we change this biased narrative? I think the first step is we have to highlight the benefits of being bivocational. The second is I think we actually have to highlight bivocational pastors and bivocational planters. And what I mean by that is we need to tell their stories. So I would say, if you're a bivocational pastor, please don't be shy about telling your story. And when you tell your story, hopefully it'll crack open the imagination of other people to say, kind of like we talked about yesterday, well, I could do that. So do it. But then I would also say, those of you that aren't bivocational, you need to be telling the stories of bivocational church planters and bivocational pastors. You need to do it to be an encouragement to them, but then also, like I said, so other people can hear stories that didn't even know that, like, I could be a school teacher and plant a church. I just know too many people. It's like, I remember, I didn't mention this earlier, but um, when I was younger, in my 20s, my brother and I were in the restaurant business together for 13 years, and we actually both became believers in the midst of of our restaurant business. And I still remember when I became a believer, going to the very church, first church I ever went to, it was an independent Christian church, I remember every single leader in that church, every single one of them told me that if I was serious about ministry, we needed to sell our secular business and go to seminary, if I was really serious. And I remember I had to choose. It was like, okay, well, I've got to choose. It's either the business world here of what my my brother and I are doing, or we need to sell everything, and and if I'm serious, and I, I need to go to seminary. I tell you, now I love talking to young people and, and helping them understand, you don't have to choose. We, we can think of, you know, I want them to understand, regardless of what God's calling you to do in the marketplace, you're in full-time ministry. We just need to help you think differently about church planting. Because if you're working 30, 40, or 50 hours a week in the marketplace, you can't plant a church the way we've always planted churches. We have to have a new imagination for church planting. Okay, so I would just say we have to capture those stories to be an encouragement to them, but also to crack open the imagination of other people. So not only highlight the benefits of bivocational, but highlight the stories of of men and women that are bivocational now. And then the third thing is I think we need to expand the language. You might even say change the language, but I I don't really, I don't change it, but I want to expand it. So you might ask, well, why do we need to change or expand the language on bivocational? Well, here's why I think that's the case. Think of the word bivocational. I actually think that word gets in the way of what we often want to see accomplished. And the way I try to explain it sometimes is think of the word bifurcate. You know know what it means to bifurcate? It means to take one thing and divide it into two parts. Well, unfortunately, I think that's exactly what we do when we think about bivocational is we compartmentalize. We say, I do my work over here so I can do my mission or ministry over here. And I don't think that's helpful. That's dualistic thinking. It's, it's sacred secular divide where we're dividing things that shouldn't be divided. So a few years ago, actually it's probably been about three years ago now, I started playing around with different words. Just again, not to change it, but to try to expand it a bit. So we started using this word co-vocational. Now, if you've never heard that strange word before, Here's why I think it's helpful. Think of the word co-vocational. Co, C-O, comes from the Latin prefix com, C-O-M, which means to have in common. It, it, it has to do with equality or, or bringing two things together that are equal. So think of words like co-pilot or co-author or co-panion or co-laborer. 
It's not about compartmentalizing. It's about aligning two things together. So we started using the word co-vocational, and I still use both bivocational or co-vocational, or sometimes now I'll just say bivo-covo, but uh, there, I have a little nuance between bivo and covo. So here, see if this is helpful. And again, this is in the book if you're interested. So when it comes to co or bivocational, here's the way I would define a bivocational pastor or planter. A bivocational church planter is one who works a second job to supplement the salary the church provides. Their hope is that the church will eventually be in a position to provide the financial support for the planter to leave their bivocational job to focus full-time on the church plant. Now, nothing wrong with that, right? The Apostle Paul, Acts 18, tent maker, that's kind of the way we, we would define a tent maker. Is a bivocational church planter, typically, they have another job because there's not enough funding to support them full-time, and their hope or dream or aspiration is that eventually that church grows big enough to support them full-time so they can leave their part-time job and focus full-time on the church, okay? Again, nothing wrong with that, but I think there's another way. Co-vocational, I define like this. Nope, I'm sorry, Jacob, go back one. There we go. A co-vocational church planter is one whose primary vocation is in the marketplace and at the same time is called to start a church. A covo planter is one who has a clear calling in the marketplace that they never intend to leave. They know that God has called them to be a teacher or a mechanic or a graphic designer or a doctor, and they desire to weave that calling into the plan to plant a church. So see what I mean by expanding? I don't want to do away with bivocational, because the way we kind of traditionally and historically define bivocational, I think that's still good. But I think there are thousands and thousands of people in our pews, in our churches, that have a full-time calling in the marketplace that they love, they know God's called and wired them to do that, but they're, they, they have a, an inkling that God wants them to start something. So that's why I think we need to use both bivocational and co-vocational. So again, covo is someone that has a primary calling in the marketplace. They never intend to leave, but they want to start something. So we need to help them think a little differently about church planting, really kind of go back to the missionary flow we talked about yesterday, is start with mission and then let the ecclesiology or the church, the form and function of the church, be birthed out of your missionary engagement. And when we do that, we have a much longer runway to where we can plan a church more uh, co-vocational rather than bivocational. So last thing here, and then we want to do some table discussion, and then um, I'd love to just dialogue if there's other aspects of this that you want to talk about. But I mentioned yesterday one of my favorite authors, Leslie Newbigin, I, I shared a quote from him yesterday. Here's another quote. It's just a good reminder for all of us uh, engaged outside the walls of the church. It says, believers participate in Christ's priesthood, not within the walls of the church, but in the daily business of the world. And really, as church leaders, we need to equip people to be a witness in the places where they live, work, and play, and not just within the walls of the church. So I want to invite Crystal up and... Um, let, I'd just love for you to dialogue. She's going to share some questions, a little different questions we had yesterday. Ha, just do some table discussion here, and then if we have the time, maybe we can come back and... and